Nowadays, most of us don't think very much about mailing a letter from coast to coast. In fact, some of us probably don't think about it at all because we don't do letters anymore. But for most of the rest of us, it's simple. You walk out of your house, you walk out to your mailbox, and you put the letters in. And four to seven days later, it's going to get there. Uh, if you wanted to get there faster, of course, you could have it go by airplane. But that's going to cost you a little bit more. But it might get you there in the same day. But it wasn't always like that. Back in the early 1920s, when airmail was just starting, things were a little bit different. Back then, sending things by airplane wasn't always faster than sending them by ground. In the early 1920s, airmail was just getting started and just becoming a thing. But there are a few problems. It's a little expensive at 24 cents, which is a little bit over $2 in today's money. There's only a few routes, and it doesn't often beat ground delivery times for several reasons. First, they didn't fly at night or in bad weather. Um, next, there were crashes. And lastly, even during daytime and in good weather, pilots frequently got lost. Back then, they didn't have Google Maps or GPS or any of those things we use today to get us where we need to go. In order for Airmail to be successful, they needed to be able to fly at night and in the weather and not get lost. So what if you built big arrows that pointed the way to get to the next city? And what if you put light beacons on those arrows on a tower so that you could see them from far away? Brilliant. But you would need a lot of them to get you from the east coast to the west coast. And so that is what happened. More than 1,500 of these airmail navigation beacons were built. Not an elegant solution, but very effective. Eventually, with advances in navigation systems, these beacons and markers would become obsolete and funding for maintaining them was stopped. Many were removed during World War II or overcome by land development and the elements. But today, scattered around the country, a few still remain. And we are going to go find one. My adventure started with a late night flight to a small town in Nevada. After a good night's sleep at a local inn, I secured transportation and started my trek south. I cross-checked my notes and looked at Google Maps. The map showed the first arrow close to the road, and after a little searching, I found it. Now, obviously, this arrow is not being preserved. Uh, portions of the arrow are missing, but no mistaking what it is. And with my selfies complete, back in the car and off to the next arrow which I knew was that way. My map study showed this arrow was near the highway and up on a hill. I parked the car, looked up, and realized that hill was much steeper than I thought. And this is where I've got to climb to get to that beacon. Okay, so I just had to climb all the way from down there. You can see the distance where the rental car is. All the way up to the top of this peak. Yeah, I think I'm almost there. Well, oh, made it to the top. It is worth the climb. Take a look at what I'm looking at. This would be the base of the arrow. What's left of the windsock over there? Front of the arrow. So these are the stanchions for the tower that would stand here. <clears throat> and you can see that part of the arrow and you can see the highway there. That's in the direction of Los Angeles. I like to find the arrow. She takes a little jog to the left there. And there's the pointy head of the arrow pointing you to Las Vegas. Well, it's obvious there's some upkeep being done on this arrow because it definitely has had a recent coat of paint. It's a nice bright yellow. All right, I think it's time to get the drone out and get some drone footage. If you're going to go looking for some of these airmail navigation markers, do some research. Make sure it's legal, make sure it's safe. But I will tell you, this one was definitely worth the trip. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.